I'm very pleased to add my biography to the studies of Sergei Rachmaninoff, who had a triple brilliant career of composer, <clears throat> conductor, and virtuoso pianist. Uh, the book brings out some of the unexplored aspects of the composer's identity as a creative artist and also of his activities beyond the world of the arts. This uh, slide gives you some information about the book. Uh, it's available from the publisher Lexington Books of Roman and Littlefield. And I also saw it on Amazon and it was, there were used copies available even before the book had come out. So I don't know how that happened, but uh, anyway, it is, it is available from the publisher and, from, uh, and on Amazon. Uh, I want to say a word about the subtitle, Cross Rhythms of the Soul. Uh, cross rhythms musically are uh, polyrhythms. They refer to rhythmic conflicts played simultaneously, such as two eighth notes played against triplet eighths. And so you have this kind of these cross movements taking place in the music and they do occur in Rachmaninoff's music fairly regularly. And it occurred to me that these conflicting patterns uh, can also characterize Rachmaninoff's life. This year of 2023, as Mr. Pidikriostov indicated, marks a double jubilee of Rachmaninoff, 150 years since his birth in 1873 in Russia, and 80 years since his death in 1943 in the US. The Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation has officially declared this year of 2023 to be the year of Rachmaninoff. And I noticed this morning on TASS that they have an interactive, uh, some kind of interactive program where you can be the conductor conducting some music of Rachmaninoff. I haven't had a chance to investigate it, but it uh, looked like it would be uh, just a wonderful, a wonderful experience. There will be major um, performances and celebrations of Rachmaninoff taking place all over the world. Art and culture at their best become a permanent part of world civilization. And the corpus of Rachmaninoff's compositions is no exception. For him who lived through the apocalyptic first half of the 20th century, music was vital for expressing the sum total of a particular individual's hopes and fears, personal relationships, striving for freedom, and a patriotism understood as a love for one's own culture and a respect, appreciation, and admiration for other cultures. He disliked extremes of any kind, whether artistic or political, and he negotiated turbulent changes in his own life of cultures, countries, and languages very successfully through hard work and the careful management of his life. Uh, when we read any translations of Rachmaninoff, we want to take, uh, take into account that he uh, knew four languages and that English was his fourth language. And so he, Russian of course was his native language, but he knew, probably knew some Ukrainian, uh, he learned French first, and that accounts uh, for this, the particular spelling of his name uh, with the two Fs at the end. Uh, and he also learned German and was very fluent in German. And so by the time he reached the U.S., you know, he was learning English as a fourth, a fourth language. And so keep that in mind as you read some uh, renderings of his actual statements in English. He was struggling a little bit. Rachmaninoff's life can actually be divided into two periods. And so we think about the period uh, of Russia, his native country from 1873 to 1917, and then 1918 to 1943 as his European and American period. My presentation is separated into four segments that should give you a sampling of what is in the book. The first describes some of the backstory of the project, which I really thought I would never finish. I, as I mentioned to Mr. Piri Kriostov, I was worried that I would just die before I finished this book and that my poor husband would be left with this manuscript that he'd have to do something with. 
but I did get it done and the publisher was just marvelous to work with. So the first describes, the first segment describes some of the backstory of the project and the remaining three segments engage the actual content of the book. And so segment one, uh, I title, you know, why the writing of yet another biography of Rachmaninoff was necessary. Why was this necessary? Rachmaninoff was an extraordinary musical artist. We all acknowledge that. Uh, even though the reception history of the 20th century started out with not so much of an appreciation of his work and then the appreciation kept growing upwards uh, among the critics I have in mind. The basic events of his life, his compositions, his concerts are well known. We have all of the details, uh, the data, you know, how many new, new works he programmed uh, for each concert tour. There are approximately 40 extant biographies of Rachmaninoff, and they're available in languages that are accessible to the West and in uh, Russian. We know all of the details of his activities. Uh, we know about his rather uneasy settling in the West. And I mention uneasy only because he didn't want to leave his native country. And so this was very difficult, it remained difficult for him um, all through his life. We can listen to his music. We have his music uh, accessible to us. Musicologists can study the scores of his compositions and discuss their merits uh, and drawbacks. All these things are known and are possible to investigate both in Russia and the West. By far the two areas of the world most familiar with Rachmaninoff's musical corpus. Although uh, in recent decades, uh, China, Japan and Latin America are catching up very quickly in their interest in his music and also their expert performance of it. Thus, why, why in the world would I want to attempt the seemingly unendable project of describing someone else's life? That of a composer whose peregrinations took him, his family, an entourage to so many parts of the world. And for a researcher, this means archives everywhere archives to visit, to pour over, to study. And so year after year, Rachmaninoff would embark on what he called the Perpetuum Mobile, a lifestyle that involved concertizing in the US and Europe in fall and winter, and spending the spring and summer in Europe. Russia under the Soviet yoke was denied him. Towards the end of his life, he made plans to return to his homeland under Stalin. This was in 1943, January of 1943, but during World War II, the logistics of his return uh, proved simply impossible. I undertook the writing of this biography as a personal project, perhaps in more ways than any project is a personal one. I gradually came to realize that I had in my cultural background, education and professional experience, the arsenal needed for tackling such a book. My Russian and Ukrainian roots, musical training and research activities that necessitated traveling to the Soviet Union, to Russia, to Europe, virtually every year resulted in knowledge that was completely authentic. My paternal grandfather, Alexander Pivin, was born in 1872 in Tsarist Russia, only one year earlier than Rachmaninoff's birth in 1873. As young boys, they both lived through the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. The young Sergei Rachmaninoff walked many times past the Church of Christ on the Spilled Blood, or Spas na Kravi, in St. Petersburg, which was built over the spot where the Tsar had been killed. My grandfather grew up in the part of southern Russia now called Krasnodar region. He was never in St. Petersburg, but was devoted to the Tsar and was a loyal monarchist. Rachmaninoff too was a monarchist. In a witty note, accepting an invitation by his musical associate Nikolai Avierino um, to a party in New York, 
uh, November 11, uh, 1933, Rachmaninoff wrote, I want to tell you that I'll be at your place to dine with your friends, among whom I warmly greet the monarchist and I reproach the socialists." Unquote. Rachmaninoff settled in a country estate in the south of Russia between the years 1902 to 1917. Both he and my grandfather loved to farm and they lived close to the land. My grandfather was a well-known writer and anti-communist activist who in his numerous publications described his life under Tsar, Nic Tsar Nicholas II. As Rachmaninoff, he fled Russia after the Bolshevik revolution and found himself in Europe during the 1920s and 1930s. They moved in similar circles, but to my knowledge never met. However, because Russian intellectuals all knew each other in Europe, they had friends in common. And one example is that Rachmaninoff knew and advised the brilliant choral conductor Sergei Zharov, known in the West as Serge Yarov, who was the conductor of the internationally famous Don Cossack Chorus. Zharov fled the Soviet Union in the same group of evacuees as my grandfather. He lived temporarily, they, he lived temporarily in Serbia, as did my grandfather, and by this time the evacuees um, had separated into smaller groups, and, um, and so they were in the same smaller group. And uh, Sergei Zharov died in Lakewood, New Jersey, which was the same city in which my father died, and they died three months apart from each other. And I am uh, reasonably certain that they knew each other. Uh, in, in that area, this would be the New York, uh, New Jersey, uh, Washington DC uh, area. The emigres all knew each other. They were a very tightly knit group. Desperate to leave Russia because of the Bolsheviks widespread acts of violence against the aristocracy, which was Rachmaninoff's social class. He left the country legally with his family in December of 1917 to embark on a concert tour in the Scandinavian countries. And the invitation gave him the opportunity that he was seeking to leave with his family. And this was in December of 1917. So they ended up spending Christmas abroad, which was a very difficult holiday for them. Rachmaninoff believed in freedom, a freedom of expression in the arts, and had experienced some of the restrictions on this freedom in the months after the revolution. His cousin, the conductor pianist Alexander Celotti, was arrested and imprisoned. Salotti's family was threatened and humiliated in various ways. And so Rachmaninoff rightly perceived a growing threat against his family and began to fear for his life. Both my grandfather and my father carried within themselves the cultural traditions and experiences of the generation of Rachmaninoff, passing them down to me by example. I grew up steeped in Russian music and I played Rachmaninoff on the piano. On my mother's side, my maternal grandmother was a music teacher and concert accompanist in Kiev. She very likely saw Rachmaninoff perform in concert at least once uh, on one of his tours of southern Russia and Ukraine. It was at first the music that drew me to considering a new biography, but then it became all of Rachmaninoff and um, in particular his rather mysterious uh, identity, his attempts to keep to keep within himself and a small circle of uh, friends. After one of my recitals of his music, I contacted Rachmaninoff's grandfather in Switzerland. I sent him a letter and to my surprise, he called me several weeks later and he didn't even um, state who he was. I picked up the phone and he started speaking Russian. And so I figured out who it was, but this was the type of game that he liked to play. And so he called me and invited me to visit him at his expense uh, in Switzerland. And so I went to the uh, Rachmaninoff Villa Senar on Lake Lucerne, just a picture postcard, a uh, picturesque, beautiful uh, place. Uh, Alexander Borisovich Rachmaninoff was very gentlemanly and very 
uh, gracious, but overall, he was known to have a difficult personality. I gained his confidence only because I had the necessary historical and cultural qualifications. My family was part of the Russian immigration. My first language was Russian and I played his grandfather's music. He grasped that what I was undertaking was to describe so that it would not be lost an entire way of life of the late 19th and first half of the 20th centuries. Thus many features and events of my life positioned me to write this biography. But what is new about it? You know, what had not been revealed before? Three major facets of the composer's life struck me as severely unexplored. Uh, his Russian Orthodox identity, his humanitarian work during World War II, and indeed throughout his life, and his muses, uh, women who were important to him personally and artistically who themselves were fascinating and talented in their own right. Before we continue, uh, I want to have you view a musical example so that you'll hold Rachmaninoff's music in your mind as we move forward. Uh, this is a short example and it gives all of us the opportunity to listen together to a work uh, from beginning, middle and end uh, performed by a major exponent of the Russian School of Piano Music, uh, Nikolai Lugansky. Lugansky has been a major supporter of Rachmaninoff. Uh, I had the chance to meet him in Florida uh, after a performance of Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 1. Uh, he is now a, a piano professor at the Moscow Conservatory. Uh, he is one of the preeminent interpreters of Rachmaninoff's music. He is very active 
He supports the Rachmaninoff Estate Museum of Ivanovka, which is several hundred miles to the south of Moscow. I've been there several times. It's an absolutely glorious place, and it tells us a great deal about what inspired Rachmaninoff uh, during many, many of his compositions. And so uh, Lugansky is one of the most important living performers of this music. He's a direct inheritor of the style and substance of the powerful Russian school of piano. And so this performance uh, took place of the Moment Musical Number no. 4 in E minor, uh, which Rachmaninoff composed in 1896. Lugansky's performance was from 2016 in the Grand uh, Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. I've uh, played this piece and I like to play it from time to time, but I don't play it nearly as quickly as Lugansky. And this is courtesy of Mr. Pini Kriostov uh, himself. Uh, there are so many uh, cartoons and comics that um, spotlight both the difficulty of Rachmaninoff's music, uh, all of the notes, the fingering. Uh, you, it's, you can't just play through the music um, right away, you have to sit down and study it and figure out which fingers to use. And so I felt this was, you know, very apropos of especially the E minor uh, moment musical. The, the piece uh, is part of the theme of demonic beauty that some of Rachmaninoff's, uh, Rachmaninoff scholars uh, have identified. Uh, the, the idea of ethereal, impassioned beauty that's almost um, you know, beyond possibility. And Rachmaninoff has been called the Paganini of the piano, and he was very fascinated uh, by the image of Niccolo Paganini, violinist, uh, legendary violinist, who, you know, as the story, um, as the story goes, sold his soul to the devil for the ability to play the violin the way he did, and also for a love of a woman. And Rachmaninoff was so fascinated with this legend that he himself conducted, uh, composed a rhapsody on a theme of Paganini in 1934. So uh, the idea of this demonic beauty, demonic not because it was evil, but because it was just impossibly uh, difficult to achieve. And so when we break down Lugansky's performance, which of course, I hate to do because it really just should be listened to in total without thinking about these things. But it's very easy to play Rachmaninoff badly, uh, to impose all sorts of sentimental elements, to play it in a schmaltzy way. And so when you think about the performance you just saw, we just shared, uh, it's very typical of a good performance of the classical performance going back to how Rachmaninoff himself played. And we don't have any videos of Rachmaninoff playing, but we do, we do have uh, audio recordings. And so we can confirm this by what we listen to ourselves. And so his Lugansky's performance, it's very clean. All the elements, all the voicings of the intricate music can be heard. It's very intense. There is a driving forward motion. Uh, I mentioned the demonic in its beauty. It's devoid of sentimentality. And this is typical for Rachmaninoff's music in general. It is beautiful in a pristine way. It's, it's very, very passionate and deep, but it's not sentimental at all. Uh, the performance has the sharp rises and falls of dynamics, the crescendo and decrescendo, typical of Russian classical music and Rachmaninoff's sacred choral music. And finally, uh, it allows the melody to speak in the midst of many complex musical phrases. Uh, we can think about uh, all, of, all, of the, all of the various notes of the melody almost as pearls on a string of pearls. And Rachmaninoff felt that the, his music needed to be, to be performed as quickly as the tempo would allow. 
so that because of the thickness of the multitude of notes that so that the melody could stand out and could be discerned. And so Lugansky's performance, I think, is very typical for this powerful Russian school of music. Some critics feel that this is going out of, um, it's kind of off the screen that it may disappear, uh, but I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's still there in uh, many of the current interpreters of Rachmaninoff. Um, when Rachmaninoff himself performed, his style was modest, undemonstrative, precise, intellectual, and confident. He manifested a dual perspective. And so he was the performer uh, communicating to the audience, performing the piece in question, but he also had this uh, so-called ocular perspective of looking down on himself performing and of measuring and planning where the music would go. This would be the composer's perspective. And so he had the whole in mind as he was kind of parsing it out in his playing. So he lived the music, but he also controlled it from some uh, point uh, beyond it. He took the uh, advances in the Russian piano language past the point uh, to which uh, Liszt had developed them in the 19th century. And so Rachmaninoff's cousin, Alexander Salotti, was one of the last uh, students of Liszt. And uh, Salotti was Rachmaninoff's uh, piano professor at the Moscow Conservatory. And so Rachmaninoff is a kind of direct inheritor of Liszt's uh, style and piano language, but then Rachmaninoff took it and he expanded it across the full range of the piano. One New York critic observed that only Rachmaninoff could pin you to your seat by the force of his interpretation and understanding of the music he was performing. As a virtuoso pianist, his, his playing was flawless. He played or conducted each piece of music, uh, again, as both a performer and a composer. He loved to perform. He loved to be in front of an audience. When he composed, quite often the piece would come to him all at once if it wasn't a large scale piece and he would have to stop his activity to write it down. <clears throat> now slide number six. And this is something, uh, an image of Rachmaninoff that you can keep in mind as uh, we move through this lecture, uh, especially when we consider some of the women Rachmaninoff uh, uh, was thinking about in the 1890s and early uh, 1900s. Here he is a young man in concert attire, circa 1898. And this would be a few years after the Maumont Musico uh, were uh, composed. And so we see a handsome man, someone who was confident, who had a great, great sense of his presence. So now segment number two, uh, Rachmaninoff's Russian Orthodox identity. Uh, this all embracing aspect of his identity, his uh, Russian Orthodox religiosity emerged from me as unexplored or misunderstood. And the examples that I have in mind uh, come from the UK and from Australia. And so these, uh, these are very fine musicologists, scholars of Rachmaninoff, uh, of his compositions, but they really didn't, didn't grasp the importance of his faith to him in their biographies. They lacked an adequate knowledge of Orthodox Christianity, uh, misrepresenting Rachmaninoff's personal beliefs and making assumptions about this faith that were either superficial or bewildering. And I have in mind the book length works of Max Harrison, uh, Barry Martin, and Geoffrey Norris. I have met Geoffrey Norris. Uh, these are excellent biographers. They, again, their musicological analysis is terrific, but this is, not the, this is not all of Rachmaninoff and this aspect of his identity was not there. And so I'm going to give you a couple of the examples. 
Uh, since Russian Orthodoxy represents one of the essential features of Russia as a distinct civilization, a biographer of a Russian Orthodox musician, uh, one who uh, articulated the importance of this faith and of God, uh, it would make sense for a biographer to learn something about the faith tradition, even at a superficial level. Uh, especially if this musician in question had uh, composed several major sacred works that were known worldwide, uh, specifically the magnum opus, the All Night Vigil of 1915, which is at, at times mistranslated as Vespers. Uh, as an educated man, Rachmaninoff had knowledge of the foundations of Eastern Christianity, his experiencing of the Russian Orthodox Church's theology and services and their various chants enabled him to compose deeply inspired choral masterpieces in the Orthodox Christian tradition. His first composition of sacred music, the choral concerto, O Mother of God Perpetually Praying, was completed in 1893, so just a few years earlier than the photo that you're seeing. And it was only one year after he had graduated from the Moscow Conservatory. Uh, Vladimir Morosan, a world-renowned specialist in Orthodox choral music, were, wrote that this work foreshadows the hand of a master, not only in its thematic material, but also in terms of choral sonority, um, and that quite simply, the 20-year-old year old composer wrote a piece of choral music that was more complex endued with greater emotional power and pushed the choral instrument to greater extremes of range and dynamic contest, uh, contrast than anything hitherto composed in the realm of Russian church music. And so this said about a 20 year old composer of a sacred work. Rachmaninoff's masterpiece, The All Night Vigil was composed in 15 parts it belongs among the world's most celebrated choral works, both beloved and feared for its difficulty. And Rachmaninoff tells a humus, humorous anecdote, uh, and I quote, I quote from my book, towards the end of movement number seven, there is a passage sung by the basses, a scale descending to the lowest B flat in a very slow pianissimo, which is very low on the piano. After I played this passage, Nikolai Danilin, who was the principal director of the distinguished Moscow Synodal Choir, shook his head saying, now where on earth are we to find such bases? They are as rare as asparagus at Christmas. Nevertheless, as Rachmaninoff continued, he did find them. I knew the voices of my countrymen and I well knew what demands I could make upon Russian bases. And so with the above in mind, I want to uh, turned to two cases of a lack of knowledge of Rachmaninoff's faith tradition and how this lack can distort the meaning of his identity. Now, this is Max Harrison, who attempts to figure out why Rachmaninoff wrote sacred music. This actually shocked me, and it's from uh, Matt Harrison's biography of Rachmaninoff. One's impression of Rachmaninoff is that he was an easygoing agnostic, uh, and he compares Rachmaninoff to Turgenev, who was an agnostic. Yet this view is hard to sustain in the face of his two great religious works, the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the All Night Vigil of a few years later. After all, Milos Velimirovich refers to them as the highest artistic achievements in the realm of Russian church music. Rachmaninoff's producing of so fervent a score as the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom is still a matter for some surprise. And so I added my blue emphasis because it is surprising that Harrison felt so surprised. If he had known something about Rachmaninoff's faith tradition, this would have been clearer to him. And so, you know, there, there are so many forms of evidence, just a firewall of evidence to the effect that Rachmaninoff was a religious man. He went to confession, he attended services when his schedule allowed, was the godfather to his close friend's children, uh, gave major support to the Russian Orthodox Church abroad and the St. Sergius Orthodox Theological Institute in Paris, financial help to Orthodox priests and bishops, even for their personal needs, as well as for church needs, requested prayer services for his daughters. He had icons in his home and venerated them. 
And even aside from all of that, we have his own statements about his faith, which cannot be construed in any other way. I owe to God the gifts given me to God alone. Without him, I am nothing. The second example, case number two, comes from a biographer, Barry Martin, who was Australian. And his, I really love his biography, uh, but I kind of was brought up short when he was talking about Rachmaninoff's choral work. And if you go back to the picture of uh, Rachmaninoff, he looked about like that when he was composing the work Pantalimon the Healer. And so uh, Barry Martin describes Pantalimon as a rustic deity who practices herbal medicine. He shakes his knobbly stick at the poisonous herbs and collects the wholesome ones. And I don't know where he got that, uh, but there wasn't more to his description of Saint Pantalimon. And here Martin misses the most important theological points. Uh, Saint Pantalimon was a late third, early fourth century physician who healed the sick without charge in the name of Christ. He was a martyr during the persecution of Christians in Rome and is formally known as great martyr Saint Pantalimon. And so uh, the Orthodox faithful ask for the saint's intercession at times of illness. Uh, the Rachmaninoff family kept an icon of Saint Pantalimon with them and it was the last icon he saw in his bedroom as he lay dying of cancer. Another icon of great martyr Saint Pantalimon, uh, and just to indicate that an understanding of Rachmaninoff's faith is essential for knowing the man and his music. Segment three, Rachmaninoff's humanitarian work for the Soviet Red Army, for people in the Soviet Union during World War II and compatriots in Europe. His money provided food, clothing, paper for artists and musicians, medicine and x-ray machines for the Red Army, support for the Russian Orthodox Church in Europe, I mentioned that, uh, financial support for writers and art, artists in Europe who were destitute, and among them were uh, Ivan Bunyan, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, uh, Ivan Ilyin, the philosopher, and Rachmaninoff helped them all with the large amounts of money that he knew would never be repaid. At one point, he received a letter from his friend in 1922 from Moscow, who described, we are all struggling to keep from dying of hunger, cold, and infectious diseases, and many people familiar to you have died. All people right now are in extremely difficult uh, situations and wait for death as a savior from their undeserved suffering. And at one point, the uh, general postmaster in Moscow declared, who is this Rachmaninoff? He is feeding half of Moscow because there were so many parcels that were received from this single person. And so uh, Rachmaninoff insisted on donating the entire proceeds for his concerts, for some of his concerts to the Red Army during World War II, despite pressures from others not to do so. He would explain that the Americans and Soviets were allies. Everyone was supporting the Americans, but no one was giving support to the Soviets. And so he was determined to do so. I'm going to move to uh, Rachmaninoff's muses, going back to the 1890s and keep the photograph of Rachmaninoff in mind. Uh, Anna Ladizhenskaya uh, was a um, was very important to him. He was in love with her and she was married. She was several years older than he and he used to uh, to ride on horseback to her uh, residence in Moscow and there apparently her estate was not too far away from Rachmaninoff's estate uh, in the Tambov area. And so her husband was uh, somewhat of a carouser and Rachmaninoff often had to, uh, you know, had to be called away to find the inebriated husband and drag him back home. Uh, the relationship was very, uh, was very proper uh, very, very deep, uh, but it, it couldn't go anywhere. And uh, so she was, she was a gypsy woman uh, assimilated into Russian society. And um, her sister was a well-known gypsy singer 
And so Rachmaninoff would give impromptu recitals with her sister, but they spent, um, he and Anna Ladishinskaya spent many hours talking and became very close. And so she was someone very much on his mind in the 1890s. And um, her significance is underscored by his dedicating a large scale work to her, his first symphony in D minor and an art song that is just gorgeous. And the first line tells you everything. Oh no, I beg you, don't forsake me. She represented in his life and music, the gypsy themes of love, loyalty, freedom, and closeness to nature that captivated Russian creative minds of the 19th century and endure in Russian creative expression to this day. I want to interject uh, a, an excerpt from Rachmaninoff's letter to a cousin. This was a platonic relationship. She was a few years older, but she was extremely important to him. And this gives an example of his inner life and uh, his expressiveness. And so we don't see Rachmaninoff this way very often. And so he writes, you and I are now approaching the fourth and at the same time last period of our personal relationship. Doesn't your sweet letter to me prove this return to a friendship? Doesn't your phrase that you think you love me as in the past also prove this? The fact that you really regretted having to leave St. Petersburg before I arrived, that I too regretted this, is in all this, so to say, the first timid breakthrough to our new, renewed, and now already faithful friendship number two. For the time being, I rejoice in your happiness and weep over your tears and sorrows. I believe that until my death, I will be your friend, and that now, thank God, we have reached the shore. And so this outpouring of a very, very deeply thinking man uh, to a woman who, for whom he had some conflicting feelings, possibly being in love, uh, but she meant a great deal to him and she occupied a permanent place in his heart. A photo of Rachmaninoff and his wife, uh, Natalia Satina. This is 1902. Uh, this would be the year of their marriage. They were married in April of that year. And she was very talented in her own right. Uh, she uh, attended the Moscow Conservatory in uh, piano pedagogy. She graduated with the silver medal and she managed all of the details of their very complex life very successfully. They had two children together, but uh, there is some evidence to the effect that maybe uh, his marriage was not, did not fulfill all of the needs that he had as a creative artist and as a person. Their marriage lasted until his death. And so as Beethoven had an immortal beloved, so Rachmaninoff may have had a lasting connection with a mystery woman whose identity has not been completely revealed. Uh, this was uh, described to me by Rachmaninoff's grandson on one of my visits in, to him in Switzerland. And he uh, described that his grandmother, Rachmaninoff's wife, had given him, had made a kind of confession to him that her husband had had another woman in his life who was very important. And the woman lived not very far from him. They were not in touch constantly, but they kept a connection. And the image that you're seeing is just a representation. Uh, Rachmaninoff was known to have a, a predilection for kind of a gypsy-ish type of, um, of woman. And so this is one part of the mystery that my biography attempts to uncover. Uh, I discovered a crossed out dedicatee line in his uh, Piano Concerto number no. two, uh, which is one of the most performed works. Very, uh, very passionate, very um, flowing with some, uh, some romantic elements. It's even been used uh, as a score in a number of movies of US uh, films. And so the feelings and the expression are very much present. And so this may have been a piece that he dedicated to her. And there were several other pieces that 
uh, her um, in, in which her inspiration might have been present. And so if this is true, I've been working with a group of five uh, Russian scholars to, to track down her genealogy. Uh, if all of this is true, then it certainly would revise some of what we know about the composition of major pieces by Rachmaninoff. And so the woman may even have lived in a house across the lake from uh, Rachmaninoff's uh, estate in Switzerland uh, across Lake Lucerne. And so at this point, I should stop. Uh, you'll have to read the book if you want to learn all of the details of my meetings with uh, Alexander Rachmaninoff and what he indicated that his grandmother had told him. Uh, this concludes my remarks. Uh, I could go on and on with anecdotes, but it's been a great pleasure to speak to you. And thank you for being with me in this lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Nolan, for your presentation. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the audience and I see some already appearing in the Q&A section. Uh, uh, my dear audience members, please go ahead and put any questions you have to, to, uh, to Dr. Nolan in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Let me jump in because I, I saw a comment about the piano teacher Kiriana Zelotti and the spelling of the last name. Zelotti with the Z was the original Russian last name, but he changed it to an S when he uh, was working in the U.S. and he taught at Juilliard. Uh, for many, many decades. So that just explains that Z and S spelling. Uh, Douglas asks, uh, did Rachmaninoff ever return to the Soviet Union after leaving in 1917? No, no, he did not. Uh, he wanted to, but the there was a great deal of violence. And if, if you look at the details of how his cousin was treated, uh, was very distressing. And some of his other relatives and his wife's relatives were arrested, uh, imprisoned for short periods of time, not for anything that they did, but for who they were. And so this was part of a large scale attack on intellectuals, uh, on uh, artists and those in the 1920s who weren't accepting the new, the new system of government. Uh, he, he did, and this is in uh, Andre Gromyko published a two volume book. He was the ambassador, as a young man, he was the ambassador to the Soviet Union in uh, Washington. And he later, of course, had a very prominent career in the Soviet Union, but Gromyko met Rachmaninoff once. And this was when Rachmaninoff applied to go back to the Soviet Union. Uh, in the 1930s, under Stalin and with the growing numbers of uh, uh, intellectuals and musicians who were persecuted, it, it was not possible. He was, he was afraid to return, but finally, I think he overcame his fears and he wanted to go home so badly that he, and we have the documents, that we can see the documents of his application to return to the uh, Soviet Union. And this was in 1943, so under Stalin. Stalin promised Rachmaninoff his own car, his own apartment in Moscow, and some, some other uh, privileges. But it, he, was, his, he died of a kind of galloping metastatic cancer of the lungs. He was a chain smoker, smoking about two packs of cigarettes a day at worst, and uh, it caught up to him. So he died of a very rapidly a developing lung cancer, between January and March, it, it, he was gone in about eight weeks. Thank you. Uh, so speaking, you, you mentioned his cousin or his, was it his cousin uh, who was yes. his teacher? So yes. obviously he was an inspiration, but uh, uh, Agnes asks, did Rachmaninoff have any, have any particular inspiration for his amazing talent? Were there other notable figures that had a profound influence on him as a musician? Oh, many, many of them. And he's, he's quite often linked with Tchaikovsky in the Russian tradition, but he has made the statement that Yes, Tchaikovsky was extremely important and very helpful to him, but that Rimsky-Korsakov, you know, from the St. Petersburg the school, from the Mighty Five, also was an equal influence on him. And 
you know, there, there was such a proliferation of composing going on that he was, he was born at a time when the music was flourishing and he had access. He, his wife was, had German, back, a German background as well. And her family, some of her family lived in Dresden. And so they spent several years in Dresden, uh, which means that he would attend all of the various concerts uh, given by the prominent conductors. And so he was influenced by the European tradition that Russia inherited and then uh, kind of modified with its own influences of uh, folklore and of the liturgical music. So the influences are, are very widespread. Uh, he admired, he loved American jazz. And so when he moved to the US, uh, he loved the music of Paul Whiteman and he and uh, Vladimir Horowitz uh, uh, and a, a number of the Russian uh, emigre composers would look for the jazz clubs to hear performances. So Rachmaninoff felt that the history of American music lay in jazz. So, so his influences were very, very broad. Thank you. Uh, so we have a, a question from um, Ivan who says that recently there were a few videos of a lady playing piano. Uh, she is of Polish extraction and is about 100 years old and claims to be a student of Rachmaninov. And Ivan's question is, um, he wonders if you know that uh, Sergei Vasilievich took stu students and are there any of his students still living and playing, who continue this Russian school of um, playing? performance. Well, I, I contend that the Russian school is continuing and it's continuing internationally, you know, certainly in the Slavic countries. Uh, he, Rachmaninoff didn't, didn't like to teach and didn't want to teach. He taught a little bit, but this was not uh, piano. He taught, I think it was choral singing for a while when, when as a young man, when he needed the money. But there was a, a, a woman who knew his wife, Yelena Zhukovskaya, and she claimed to be one of Rachmaninoff's students. She may have received some coaching from him, maybe had a meeting with him. Uh, it's, it's a question that I can't fully answer, but it's, I think many, many pianists would like to say that they were Rachmaninoff's students. And someone who was, you know, over 100, uh, you know, it's possible that there was some connection, but according to what Rachmaninoff himself has said and what we know about him, he really, he didn't have any students. And unfortunately he, he died before establishing his own school and his own method, you know, the way Liszt produced so many students, but Rachmaninoff just didn't do that. And that's, that's a shame. So I would say probably not, but the, this pianist, uh, mentioned, you know, maybe some connection with Rachmaninoff, but formally he did not teach. He did not have students uh, in, uh, you know, continuously, you know, across a period of time. And so whether a session with Rachmaninoff or some coaching would constitute being a student, you know, I think that's, yeah, you know, that's, that's debatable. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaking of performance, students, teachers, Yulia is asking, I'm teaching piano and my students are always asking me, when am I ready to play Rachmaninov? I even have an idea to make an intermediate piano arrangement of some of Rachmaninov's piano pieces so my students can get familiar with his music. That's a lovely idea. Rachmaninov was a great proponent of transcription and uh anything that can help students access Rachmaninoff. And he felt, he actually published a, a page long article. I don't know if it was in the Etude, but one of the major musical publications of the 1920s. And he just felt that starting at age four, you know, the music students should have the best possible teacher that from the very start, a good foundation needed to be laid. And so he was interested in pedagogical matters uh, also, Celotti was a master transcriber of music. So he was known as a teacher, a composer, kind of an entrepreneur of music in St. Petersburg. 
and also uh, Celotti was married to the daughter of the founder of the Kerejakov Museum. So he had some money at his disposal, uh, but he was also a, a master transcriber. And so anything that can be done to help students along, and in terms of when students should study Rachmaninoff, I think it depends on the student. But, you know, there's a uh, kind of a, uh, a personal maturity that goes along with just the technical prowess. Uh, you know, the young student, the teenage student playing a large and complex work, you know, can that student convey what is in the work as well as someone who has experienced a little bit more of life? You know, that's another question. But I think it's a lovely project to, you know, to bring students along with some transcriptions uh, or reduction to a level that is appropriate for them. Thank you. And I think this will be the last question. Uh, we have a question from Carol. And you mentioned this during your um, presentation, Dr. Nolan, you said that there are no um, films of, of Rachmaninoff playing, is that correct? Are there, Carol's yeah. question is, did Rachmaninoff ever appear in any film recordings? There are, there are some family uh, film recordings that have made their rounds and they've appeared in different documentary films. Uh, the British have made a couple of the earlier ones and they're really very well done. And it's the same ones, you know, there once in a while, there's a little snippet, something, something additional discovered, but they're of him, uh, of him interacting with his family, you know, throwing the ball at the dogs and holding his granddaughter. Uh, to, to my knowledge and to the knowledge of the colleagues I've worked with, there is no film of him performing. Uh, there are some photographs taken of him, and they were kind of illegally taken of him during one of his many performances at Carnegie Hall. And there's a whole series of those which are thrilling. And um, he, he played at Carnegie Hall almost 100 times. So, but to my knowledge, there is no, no film recording of his performance, but there are some family videos that have, they've been around for a few decades but the British have put them up in a couple of document, short documentary films that I think are very nice. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll finish with just a quick um, opportunity for you to maybe address something, 60 seconds, a hundred and you know, uh, two minutes. Is there anything that, uh, that you would like to share with our audience? Any tidbit that maybe you wanted to include initially in your presentation, but because of time, we're not able to, um, anything to sort of close uh, today's presentation with? Well, there's, there's so much. Uh, I, you know, I would just um, exhort all of you to listen to his music and uh, to, uh, you know, maybe in an email follow-up, I can recommend some of the recordings. Uh, there, there, there are many fine pianists and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Walter Gieseking, a uh, German a pianist of uh, the 1940s, a uh, fine, fine uh, pianist of Rachmaninoff. Uh, Vladimir Horowitz, you know, is well known. He makes, he makes more mistakes maybe than some others, but, but um, very sparkling and he certainly comes from the, you know, comes out of that rock school of piano. Uh, and so, basically just to listen to the music and familiarize yourselves with it because the more you get to know it the more you know the richer the experience is and to listen to the music in its entirety you know there are so many kind of snippets around give yourselves the time to just enjoy the music because, because I think in that his message to the world uh, can be found rather than in any words that we can produce about it. <laughs>